coming up on The Overcoming Life with Jimmy Evans. People may have told you that you wouldn't be successful. You may have been sitting somewhere in a funeral and and the devil said to you, if God loved you, then why would he allow this to happen? Listen, I don't understand everything about God, but I don't want a God so small that I can understand him. But in those times in life that, that life is beyond our ability to comprehend, we simply have to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. The devil uses pain and trauma in our lives is an opportunity to speak. And let, let me say this now. I don't believe the worst thing about pain is the pain itself. And I think you would agree with that. The worst thing about pain is the message that it brings. Because there's always a message in pain. Rejection, abuse, disadvantage, disappointment, failure, sin, sickness, chronic sickness, trauma, loss, All of those things are an opportunity for the devil to come and to use those to deceive us. Jesus said, the thief does not come except to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life, that they may have it more abundantly. The devil, what makes the devil dangerous is not just that he's evil, it's that he disguises himself. And we're going to read a story in just a minute about Adam and Eve, but When the devil came to Adam and Eve, he didn't come as the devil. He never does. He came as a serpent. And serpents are dangerous because they're so stealthy. They they don't present themselves. And so he came not presenting himself, but just bringing this argument in Eve's mind about sin and God and the the word of God and all those kinds of things, ultimately causing them to fall. But but let me tell you the devil's perfect disguise. This is what makes him so dangerous. His perfect disguise is us. See, many times when the devil is introducing thoughts into our minds, we don't know it's the devil until you learn to uncover the devil's lies and his deceptions. And you know about spiritual warfare, which means taking our thoughts captive that I'll talk about. And so you're his perfect disguise. And I'm, I'm going to say something to you, and I want you to listen, because in this message, I want you to think about what, what I'm saying right now. Many of the things that have hurt your life the most that are in your mind were actually introduced by the devil, not you. You did not tell yourself those things. God certainly, in in his second favorite disguise, is God. See, he loves just to introduce thoughts into our mind and for us to believe that they came from us because that way we're not going to resist them because they're our thoughts, not his thoughts. But his second favorite disguise is God. And see, when the devil is coming to lie to you, sometimes he wants you to believe it's God. Sometimes he wants you to believe that God is speaking to you because his only purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. What he can't steal, he kills, and what he can't kill, he'll destroy. And so Satan is going to constantly be coming to us, introducing thoughts into our minds, especially using hurt and trauma as his open door to do that. Let me give you two biblical examples of this. And the first is Adam and Eve. And this is Genesis chapter 3. The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it nor touch it lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Then let's go down to verse eight. It says, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded that you should not eat? So the devil, the devil comes to Adam and Eve, especially Eve, it begins with Eve. And he says to them, has God surely said that you can't eat from these trees? And she says, well, the the day that we eat of the tree, we'll die. And he says, you won't die. Was that true? Well, they did die. He's a liar. He always lies. And so he accused God. Let me say this. The devil's really good because he convinced two perfect people in a perfect paradise that the person who put him there was evil. You got to be good when you can do that. Let me just say this about God. Our God is a fabulous God. 
He didn't create us in hell. He didn't create us in a ghetto. He didn't create us in a wilderness. He created us in a paradise because he's a good God. And the Bible begins in a paradise and it ends in a paradise because our God is a good God. But the devil, the devil's always out to accuse God and he'll use any circumstance, but he's so good. They had no trauma in their past. They didn't have a bad daddy or a bad mama. They didn't grow up in poverty. They had never had a bad day in their life. But here comes the devil, accusing God to them and convinces them there's something wrong with God. So they eat the fruit. And the instant they eat the fruit, see, they begin to hide from God. And God walks up and he says, why, why are you hiding from me? And he says, I was afraid because I was naked. Wait just a minute, who, who made him naked? God made him naked without shame. Genesis 2, 25 says, and they were both naked without shame. They had no fear whatsoever of their nakedness, but, he, but God says this to Adam. That's a question. And by the way, God never asked a question to get the answer. He asked a question to give the answer. Who told you that you were naked? He's trying to get Adam to think. How did, how did this thought get into my head? God made us naked. We weren't ashamed of our nakedness 10 minutes ago. How did this thought get into my head? Well, let me give you the answer. The devil came and tempted them and deceived them. They ate the fruit. And when they ate the fruit, they made a mistake. They sinned. And the instant they opened the door through their sin and failure, that opened the door for him to speak this into their spirits. You're defective. There's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with you. Your bodies are detestable. Was that, was that true? They were glorious. <laughs> they lived for over 900 years. These people had bodies. These people were beautiful. These people were glorious. They, had the, they were made in the image of God. It was the exact opposite of the truth. There's... There's something wrong with you. So all of a sudden, his perfect, the devil's perfect desire comes true. They divide from each other and God. See, that's all, all the devil ultimately wants to do is just keep you from God in healthy relationships because that's what he hates the most. He hates, he hates family. He hates marriage because it looks like God. He hates God. He wants to keep you away from God. So ultimately, all he's trying to do is to keep you separated from God in any healthy relationship by introducing lies into your mind. Who told you that you were naked? Who told you that you were worthless? Who told you that you couldn't succeed? Who told you that you were nobody? Who told you that God couldn't use you? Who told you that God didn't love you? Who told you that? Because every single one of us at some point in our lives, in pain, in trauma, in failure, there's that thought, there's that thought. Adam didn't understand who gave him that thought, but he was afraid. He was hiding from his healer. He was hiding from his maker, and he was divided from his wife. That's the mark of the devil. The devil's evil. He never keeps a promise, and he never will. It's amazing to me that a God who is so faithful could be so mistrusted, and a devil who has never kept a promise could be so followed. Everyone experiences pain on the journey of life. These unresolved hurts impact every relationship in our lives, but God desires to heal and redeem us. In this inspiring series called The Hurt Pocket, Jimmy Evans will show you how to identify and resolve life hurts, the steps to making peace with your past, and how to create positive legacy for generations. With your gift of any amount, we'll send you the book, When Life Hurts, which will show you how to remove and resolve every negative event from your past that is keeping you from your God-given destiny. And with your gift of $65 or more, you can receive the Hurt Pocket series on CD or as an audio download. Plus, receive the life-changing book, When Life Hurts. If you want to receive access to the Hurt Pocket series on DVD or a video download, as well as When Life Hurts, they're yours for a gift of $90 or more. You can experience a new level of freedom and fulfillment today. Here's another example. It's the Apostle Peter. This is Matthew 16. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem 
and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and, and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. But then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Can you imagine being in an argument with Jesus and him calling you Satan? I mean, you say, Jesus, well, you know, knucklehead maybe, but not Satan. You know what I mean? I, well, he wasn't talking to Peter. He was talking to Satan. Let me tell you this story. Peter was a fisherman. And there's nothing wrong with fishermen, but they were commoners. And one day the Son of God walked up to the Sea of Galilee and said, come follow me. And he became somebody. He wasn't just a fisherman anymore. He was the follower of the Son of God. And Jesus raised the dead in Peter's presence. Peter was known among Israel as a follower of Jesus Christ. He was someone. He would stand with Jesus in the presence of multitudes when he fed the 5,000. All of the miracles of Jesus. I mean, Peter was there as an eyewitness. He was somebody. He was somebody. And I don't know what had happened to him earlier in life, but maybe he felt like he was nobody. So Jesus plainly is telling the disciples, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to be killed. He just told them flat out. He told them many times. I'm going to do it. Well, Peter is hearing through trauma. And the devil uses those, those kinds of... Well, by, by the way, that's the best news they had ever heard. Jesus is going to die, become the Savior of the world. Peter's going to get filled with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost and become the preeminent apostle of Jesus. See, all, it was all good news, but when, when, you're hearing through eyes of, when you're hearing through ears of pain, you hear different. And Jesus is telling them all good things, but here's what Peter hears. I'm going to go back to being a nobody. I'm going to lose the only person who's ever believed in me. I'm going to be the laughing stock of Israel. And here's what he's hearing. So in his pain and in his fear that is, Satan is there as a serpent. Peter doesn't know it. Jesus knows it. As a serpent, the devil is there introducing thoughts into Peter's mind. And Peter says, no, you, no, you, it will not happen to you. And Jesus turns around and says, you get behind me, Satan. And Peter's like, whoa, excuse me. <laughs> Satan's right there. Satan's right there. He was at the Last Supper. Satan was present at the Last Supper because at the Last Supper, he entered the body of Judas Iscariot. And Jesus knew he was there because he turned to him and said, you're the son of the devil. See, we don't get it sometimes. We don't get it. It's not always Satan himself, but it's demonic entities that are there to ruin our lives. And in Peter's trauma... He's hearing Jesus speak. It's touching a nerve in him of insecurity, a nerve of fear, a nerve of previous pain. And there's the devil using that opportunity to introduce those thoughts into his mind. He's the hurt whisperer. If we have hurts, unresolved hurts or life issues, we have faulty messages within us. And most of us do. If you have an unresolved issue in your life of pain, I promise, I promise you, there is a thought. The, the pain isn't the worst part. The worst part is the thought, the, the message that came in that pain. Karen and I both had these, and um, here were my, through the pain of my past, uh, I came into adulthood with five main messages. The first is I was a freak. This was, this was a message that I had early in life. I was taller than my second grade teacher. I had a big silver tooth here as I got my next door neighbor shot this out with a slingshot. And when the doctor replaced it, he, he gave me a tooth I could grow into. And um, it was a big, big silver tooth. And my, brother, my brothers, Damien and Lucifer, they called me. <laughs> that joke always works. And I, it, it makes, you know, I just love it because they, all they did to me, I have the microphone now. And... Uh, <laughs> But my brothers call me Bucky the Silver Tooth Beaver. That's good for your self-esteem, isn't it? So that, that was, so just through my physical, you know, features when I was a kid, there was a message in me to Delta that I was a freak. Something wrong with me. Anything good will be taken away from me. Anything good. I remember I played baseball and I remember I was on a baseball team and I just was having a big time. I was maybe 10 years old. 
And I came home and, uh, from baseball practice one day and my mother said, uh, you can't play on the baseball team anymore. And I said, what's wrong? She, because my birthday was October. Uh, I was too old. And that happened so often um, that I would get something and lose it. And I had this message that anything good I have will be taken away. I'm a burden. And I'll talk about that more in just a minute. That was a message in my spirit. If people really knew me, they would reject me. That's the way I felt. And I'll always be disappointed. Karen, Karen, here are the messages that Karen came into adulthood with. There's something is wrong with me and it can't be fixed. And, I, and I, when I was preparing this message, I asked Karen, Karen, what do, you, what do you think your messages were? She said that was the big one, the big one. And it came through pain. She, I'm stupid. Uh, I'm fat and I'm ugly. There's something mentally wrong with me and I'm not normal. These, these were the thoughts. And I remember when, when I married Karen, that's the way she thought. That, I've never met a person with more self-hate than Karen when we uh, got married. Other common thoughts that people come into adulthood with, I'll never succeed. God loves other people more than me, people who are pretty, spiritual, talented. I've sinned too much for God to forgive me. You can't trust people. They'll always disappoint you. If God loves me, why did he allow blank to happen? Where was God? You know, Maybe it was the death of a loved one or something like that. I can't change. I'll always be this way. I'll never be a good Christian. Something bad is going to happen to me or my family to pay me back for what I've done or because I don't have enough faith. God can't use me. It's hopeless. I won't go to heaven. I've got to take care of myself because nobody else will. And those are just some, some of the examples of how in our pain the devil comes to lie to us and embed these messages that, that we think are normal or we think are just us, but they're not. They're the devil. So I want to talk about how to destroy the devil's lies that limit our lives. And I want to say this now. I think everybody's got them. If you've never dealt with this, I'm just going to tell you, you got them. And especially if you've got unresolved pain in your life and issues in your life, these things are in there. So how do you get rid of them? Well, the first step is to expose the thought to the light. And even ask, you may know the thought. As we're sitting here talking, you can just make yourself a list. Okay. But sometimes we don't. Ask the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And Jesus said he'll lead you into all truth. So I was, you know, there's been so many things the Lord has set me free from, including all those thoughts that I just mentioned. I'm free from those. I don't know. It was maybe 15 years ago or so. And, and I was having a, a quiet time one morning. And here's, here's what the Lord said to me. You're a blessing and not a burden. And that challenged every message I'd ever received about my life because from day one, I felt like wherever I went, I was a burden. Can I tell you something? I'm a blessing. I'm not a burden. I couldn't, I couldn't, and let me tell you the importance of that. I couldn't receive. I couldn't receive. If a person, if, if anybody wanted to do anything for me, I couldn't receive it because I felt like I can't take that because I'll, I'll be a burden. But I've learned to receive in a healthy way. I'm not a moochy preacher, thank God. You know, but I'm saying, I've learned to receive knowing that I'm not a burden, I am a blessing. And I can go to God and boldly ask him for anything that I need knowing that I'm not a burden to my God. And that's an example of a thought being exposed to the light. And I honestly did not consciously know that that thought was in me until the Lord spoke to my heart. Let me say this to you now. When you get before the Lord in your quiet time, you need to enunciate. You need to say those things that are in your heart that maybe you feel ashamed of. Maybe, you know, before this message, you didn't even realize how, how deadly it was or the origination of that. You need to say to God, God, this is a thought in my head and I bring this into the light. But you also need to say to the Holy Spirit, if there's something in me that I'm not even aware of. Holy Spirit, speak that to my heart and repair these faulty thoughts that are in there through the disappointments and pain and failures in my life. And he will. He'll be faithful to it. And let me tell you about the Holy Spirit. He won't overwhelm you. He's very patient. So he'll do it in his time. But he'll begin to do it immediately. But when the, the devil works in darkness... But God works in light. And when you bring it into the light, it's now in God's domain. The second thing that you do is to expel any thought that doesn't agree with God's word. 2 Corinthians 10. We, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare 
are not carnal but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. The weapons of our warfare are taking, the warfare is in our minds. This is Golgotha. Jesus died on Golgotha. This is the place of a skull. And Satan attacks us just like Adam and Eve, just like he did Peter. He attacks us in our mind because whoever controls our mind controls us. And if we're not free in our minds, we're not free. And these arguments, these high things in our minds that exalt themselves, these strongholds that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God, we have to take them captive. We have to take these thoughts into obedience to Christ. And that means every thought in my mind, I'm going to compare it to what God says to me. And this is the third point here. And my final point, express your agreement with God's word. Confess God's word. When God began to speak to me that I was a blessing and not a burden, I had to begin to say it with my mouth. I'm a blessing and not a burden. I'm a blessing and not a burden. And when I began to agree, I had to put faith in what God was saying because I knew it was true, but my heart didn't agree with it because of the pain of my past. And so express your agreement. What does God say about me? And here's the issue. Um, you may be saying to yourself, I'll never succeed. Well, you know, I've done too much for God to forgive me and all those kinds of things. Well, what does God say about you? Here's Jeremiah 29, 11, And I love this scripture because of the context of it. God says, I know my thoughts that I think toward you. Now, the reason I love that scripture is, have you ever been in an argument with someone trying to tell you what you're thinking? A woman, excuse me, not, I'm not, no, no, I didn't mean that. I uh, didn't mean that. Karen's gone and I feel real bold. So, but, but have you ever been in an argument with somebody and they're just telling you what you're thinking? And you're saying, you don't know what I'm thinking. Don't tell me what I'm thinking. Jeremiah 29, 11, they're telling God what he's thinking. You don't love us. You've forsaken us. What have you done with us? And I love the context. I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Don't, don't tell me what I'm thinking. Thoughts of good and not evil to give you a future and a hope. Psalm 139 says that the day you were created in your mother's womb, that God had so many thoughts about you, they couldn't be numbered. They're more than the sand on the seashore. God, in detail, planned out your life and every thought was a good thought. And nothing the devil has done is cancel out God's good plan. And regardless of where you are in life, God can get you back on the path in a short period of time. Yeah. What does God say about me? What does God say? And you have to agree with that. You have to begin to confess that. Whatever's been done to you in life, God doesn't throw away people. You, you haven't done too much that God can't use you. You're, you're going to be successful if you obey God. People may have told you that you wouldn't be successful. You may have been sitting somewhere in a funeral and, and the devil said to you, if God loved you, then why would he allow this to happen? Listen, I don't understand everything about God, but I don't want a God so small that I can understand him. But in those times in life that, that life is beyond our ability to comprehend, we simply have to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be, I don't understand this. I don't understand this. But blessed be the name of the Lord. Let me tell you something. After living as long as I've lived, there were things that I didn't understand 30 years ago, and I stand here today and I say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Because he did it and it all worked out for his good. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Don't let the devil camp out in your brain. Don't let the devil use pain as an opportunity to slither up and whisper a lie that's gonna ruin your life. And all of us have done it. All of us have done it innocently because we just don't know how to deal with these kind of issues. People don't typically teach us this kind of stuff. And so pain accumulates in our hurt pocket. And that hurt and that pain becomes a place of darkness for the devil to come and whisper thoughts and lies that keep us in bondage. And Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. God loves you. Your life is precious. He can use you. And regardless of what has happened in your life, he can redeem it and he will redeem it. But he can only work with truth. I hope you enjoyed that teaching. You know, one of the greatest truths is that Jesus came to set us free from sin and all of the consequences of sin, all the pain that comes from sin to defeat the devil so that we don't have to live under the influence of his lies and also 
to free us from the generational bondage, the iniquities, the inner vows, and all the generational bondage that can come with our sin, our parents' sin, somebody else's sin, and certainly the devil's always there to try to entrench that pain within our lives. And this series is called The Hurt Pocket. And this series is talking about the fact that we can live totally free from all of the pain, from all the grief, from all the anguish that has come in our lives previously through rejection, through the death of a loved one, through loss, through failure, however it came. We can be set totally free to live victorious and to live joyful. And that's what I pray for you. I pray that God will do a deep work in your life so that you can experience the fullness of God in every area. We're gonna continue now on this series, The Hurt Pocket, so stay with us. I'll see you next time here on The Overcoming Life. Find hope and healing from the pain you carry with Jimmy's inspiring series, The Hurt Pocket, available on CD, DVD, or as a digital download. We'll also include Jimmy's companion book, When Life Hurts. The Hurt Pocket series on CD or audio download and the book are yours for a gift of $65 or more, or receive the series on DVD or video download and the book for $90 or more. The Hurt Pocket series will show you how to identify and resolve the hurts of life. God's desire to heal and redeem you, and the steps to making peace with your past. Let me tell you about the silly thing about hiding from God. You're hiding from your healer. When he touches pain, it doesn't hurt. When he touches pain, it goes away. When you support The Overcoming Life with an online gift of any amount, we'll send you Jimmy's book, When Life Hurts. Create a positive legacy as you heal from the hurts of life. Experience the Hurt Pocket series today. Thank you for watching The Overcoming Life with Jimmy Evans.